Good afternoon. My name is Timothy Hampton. I'm the director of the Doreen B. Townsend Center for the Humanities at the University of California at Berkeley. I'm happy to welcome you to today's edition of the ongoing series of Berkeley Book Chats. The Book Chats feature faculty members in the humanities at Berkeley discussing recently published research. Many of our Book Chats highlight the innovative interdisciplinary work carried out by faculty and students at Berkeley. However, it's a rare pleasure for us to host a truly interdisciplinary conversation as we are doing today. The object of today's discussion is the new book by Ian Duncan of the English department titled Human Forms, the novel in the age of evolution, just out from Princeton University Press. Ian will be in conversation with Kevin Padian, professor of integrated biology at Berkeley. While professors Duncan and Padian discuss the new book, those of you watching online have the opportunity to ask questions of our guests by using the Q&A function on your Zoom platform. So without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Ian Duncan and Kevin Padian to talk about Human Forms, the novel in the age of evolution. Thanks, Tim. And uh, I'd just like to begin by thanking you and your um, uh, your colleagues at the Townsend Center for hosting this and to uh, thank Kevin also, who's from another part of campus and really has no obligation to come and uh, participate here in the humanities, but it's it's wonderful to have you here. And uh, and it's it's one of the, the great pleasures of being at Berkeley is that uh, borders between fields and disciplines are very porous and there's a lot of transaction uh, and traffic uh, among them. Yeah, it's a real thank you so much for asking me, Ian. It's it's a real um, pleasure and an honor to do this. Um, you know, you and I have spoken about topics intermittently over the years, and I was really delighted to get your book and to read it. Um, it's 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 always so nice when um, when when the the sciences and the humanities can get together, especially on on ideas that are so incredibly seminal and central as as evolution is and it's such a complex subject now now you've you've written previously about about sir walter scott's novels and his his work figures prominently in here as well in part with, along with many other people um can you say a bit to start about about this book how you what made you want to write this what were you looking for what stimulated you to to take this on Sure, yes. Uh, initially, I thought I would be writing a book on Darwin. Um, uh, that was my intention. Uh, and, and that's still something I, I want to pursue. Uh, but this project was really spurred by trying to make sense um, of a late novel by Scott. It's, it's, uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned Scott. Uh, he was really the way into this project. Um, Scott, near the end of his life, uh, wrote a very bizarre novel called Count Robert of Paris, set in Byzantium in Constantinople uh, at the end of the 12th century. Um, and it's, it's a novel, it was mangled in, being, in going to press, Scott was ill, his executors, his literary executors and his publisher freaked out when they saw the manuscript that he was sending them. And people have not known how to make sense of it. Uh, it's a novel that is set far away from Scotland and from the uh, the trajectory of Scottish history, that the making, uh, which Scott uses as a way of exploring the making of uh, European modernity in, in his earlier Waverley novels. Uh, it's a novel set in Constantinople, and it features this bizarre cast of characters, including non-human characters. Um, there's an elephant, uh, there's a tiger, uh, and there's an eight-foot-high orangutan who understands Anglo-Saxon and has his own sort of strange speech. Uh, and trying to get my head around this novel, I uh, and looking a little bit into its contexts, um, uh, I discovered uh, that the early reception of pre-Darwinian evolutionist uh, scientific thought in Great Britain took place in Edinburgh, um, geared towards the, the work of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck and Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, um, figures who've now sort of became the roadkill in the official narrative of the triumphal progress of evolutionary theory culminating in the work of Darwin, uh, but whose work was extraordinarily uh, influential and far more diffuse in, in British literary culture, I think, than, than a lot of people have uh, given it credit for until quite recently. And Scott was attuned to this work, um, particularly to the revival of 
uh, the notion, um, the so-called orangutan hypothesis, uh, uh, which Lamarck promotes, but was current before Lamarck in, uh, ironically in Rousseau's writings, but also in Scott's own countryman, uh, Lord Monboddo and his speculations on human history. Uh, the notion that the orangutan might be uh, these mysterious great apes out there somewhere uh, in, the, in the peripheries of empire might be the specimens of natural man that Rousseau uh, called for uh, in his discourse on the origins of inequality, human ancestors or relatives or, or uh, a human species that had not learned the arts of speech. And, and this I think is what Scott's novel is engaging and it's, uh, it's setting uh, Constantinople, the, the great world historical city of late antiquity, a city in which Scott um, imaginatively dismantles the, the linear and progressive trajectories of the nation-based history that had been uh, the basis of his earlier fiction. Um, and trying to think my way into this novel, I, I, I found it giving me new, new ways of thinking about Scott's earlier fiction, a particular way that the, the, uh, what Georg Lukács calls the, his, the classical form of the historical novel established by Scott, massively influential throughout Europe and beyond um, throughout the 19th century, claimed as its premise uh, the idea of a stable and universal human nature. Scott appeals to that in the introductory chapter to Waverley, his first novel, as, as well as his later medieval romance, Ivanhoe. Um, and this got me thinking uh, that this, this is the premise of, of the novel as such, as, as a genre, particularly as it begins to reorganize itself um, and claim a kind of cultural respectability and legitimacy in the mid 18th century. Uh, Fielding famously claims hum uh, human nature as the, uh, the proper subject of his novel in the um, prefatory chapter to Tom Jones. Uh, and Fielding is picking up on states statements such as those made by David Hume uh, almost contemporaneously uh, in his treatise of human nature and then in the inquiry uh, uh, into human understanding. Uh, that claim the science of man as the sort of super science, the meta science, the science of all sciences uh, of the European Enlightenment in which all other secular inquiries will be subsumed and will make sense. Um, uh, this is the, the basis of the, no of the novel as such as Fielding claims it and it remains a claim that gets made over the next 120, 125 years. We see it made at the opening of George Eliot's uh, novel Middlemarch, uh, 1872. Uh, often taken to be in, in, in the critical tradition, the sort of the apogee of uh, British, if, uh, if not European realism. Uh, and it's, it's a premise, a principle that is out there in plain sight and is seemingly so obvious and so boring uh, that has, it has not attracted systematic critical attention. Uh, so I thought I would begin thinking about this, particularly as uh, it became apparent to me that the, uh, the ascendancy of the novel towards its um, becoming the kind of major imaginative literary form in, in uh, Western Europe by the early 19th century uh, operates through this claim on a stable, universal, knowable human nature at the same time that human nature as a scientific project um, uh, is going in the reverse direction. Um, uh, is entering into categorical crisis. Um, uh, this begins in the generation after Fielding and Hume uh, with Buffon, whose uh, great natural history um, begins to situate the human among other creatures as subject to the determining forces of geography and history. Um, Buffon sort of draws back from the implications of this and reinstates a sort of metaphysical explanation for why humans are actually absolutely distinct from all other life forms. Uh, but, um, but Buffon had sort of opened Pandora's box, as it were, and, and uh, Charles Darwin himself in the, um, in the Origin of Species, where he looks back at his precursors in uh, pre-Darwinian evolutionist thought, begins with Buffon and recognizes him as uh, uh, somebody who, who began to open the subject. Um, and what I found was that the question that, that arises is, well, then what differentiates the human from the rest of life once you fully situate the human within this new discourse, natural history? And the powerful and influential response to that is one that's articulated in a sort of provocative and ironic 
fashioned by Rousseau, but it's taken up by the, the major thinkers of the 18th century Scottish Enlightenment, um, by Adam Ferguson, Adam Smith and others, is the notion of development. Humans are the only creatures uh, that have a progress, have a history that pertains to the species as well as to the individual. All other animals, um, according again to um, these 18th century scientists, uh, develop um, uh, ontogenetically in their lifetimes, but uh, a lion or a monkey is the same now as it was thousands of years ago, according to these thinkers. Um, the problem, of course, happens when you get Lamarck and other thinkers extending this developmental principle to the entire natural system. If all natural forms, it turns out, actually have a history, are mutable over time, uh, develop, mutate into one another, then that human exception disappears and is destabilized. So I, I found myself reading um, a series of major novels and not only in English, it soon became apparent this would need to be um, a field of inquiry that looked at German and French developments in part because the major pre-Darwinian evolutionist thinking is going on over in the German life sciences and embryology and then in France. Um, but also thinking about key novels, um, works like um, Goethe's Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship, the supposedly prototypical or archetypal Bildungsroman, the, the, the work that uh, is credited by a lot of critics with reorganizing the novel in the era of European Romanticism uh, into its, its 19th century format, where, the no where all novels become stories of development, all novels become developmental. Um, what George Eliot and her circle called the developmental hypothesis, um, an idea that did not just um, pertain to organic life, but uh, to all human processes, to the history of religions, um, the history of cultures of societies, that development hypo hypothesis uh, becomes the principle of, of the novel and particularly of, of, of the realist novel um, as it begins to have its norms and protocols defined um, uh, and solidified in the course of the 19th century. So I find myself reading, um, uh, I think a much more varied and unstable story of the novel uh, in its relation to these scientific developments. Uh, and it turned out to be a project that engaged far more with the pre-Darwinian uh, evolutionist thinking, um, not just from uh, those figures who worked in the natural sciences like Lamarck or Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, but thinkers like Herder, um, who turned out uh, to be a, a wonderful discovery of this project. I had not really sat down and read Herder before, but uh, who I think emerges as a still under-recognized major figure in the diffusion and popularization of an, of an, of an evolutionist thinking of the history of the cosmos. Um, his great early work, um, Ideas for a, um, a Philosophy of the History of Humankind, is translated uh, into, into English in 1800 and published by the publisher of Wordsworth and uh, Godwin um, and Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, so I found myself uh, exploring this, this very rich um, pre-Darwinian uh, legacy of developmental thought, um, uh, not just within the, the life sciences, but, but across a whole range of domains, just as those domains are beginning to get separated out and professionalized uh, in the course of the 19th century. And finding, uh, uh, finding myself able to think, I think, more, more precisely than I had before about uh, ways in which we can think capaciously about the history of the novel in the 19th century without having to kind of reduce it around a, a totemic form of realism, uh, which has largely been imposed retrospectively on our idea of the 19th century novel by later criticism, uh, to understand exactly what a figure like uh, Charles Dickens is, is, is getting at in some of his great novels um, as alternative ways of thinking um, about that category realism rather than seeing Dickens as somebody who, who isn't, alas, George Eliot or um, who, who can't do character properly and that sort of thing. Um, uh, so it, it, it's very much a project, I think, about the novel, um, uh, though uh, I also do make claims for ways in which novels are sort of actively themselves experimental uh, literary and imaginative forms in, in, in um, playing with these uh, debated and controversial, often scandalous ideas and hypotheses that were around at the time.
Yeah, I, th- I I was amazed. Thank you. I was amazed at at how at your your grasp of all these evolutionary and, and natural historical um, savants and philosophes and all of the very different currents that for scientists today at least are so difficult to parse out. We just don't understand how they were thinking because we don't think that way. How could they have all this evidence for evolution in front of them and not tumble to this to this idea, right? But when you go back and you read these people, the 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 degree to which they thought about how to integrate everything is so wonderful that the European transcendentalists alone, which I always find very different from the American yeah, ones, right. uh, are, are just are really, I mean, it's good to put it, he's trying to find, trying to find the mind of God through nature. Everything he does is, is crafted toward putting this together. And, and this is the, one of the wonderful parts because your treatise moves so nicely between the two meanings of development and evolution. Of course, in German, it's the same word, Entwicklung, but in the, in the Romance languages and, and English, whatever it is, is a hybrid, we look at this differently. And, and the transcendentalist, it seems to me, had this fluid idea of how development really could work with respect to change, which you find even in the last gasp of this in England with Richard Owen in the later part of, well, the, you know, most of the uh, 19th century. Um, how, how do you find that fluidity between the two meanings with, with evolution and development working for, for you when you were constructing this novel, or this book? Right. Um, yeah, I, I, the fluidity is, is there in the, the objects of study. So in that sense, I think it was generative, I think. Um, uh, yeah, the, in some ways, the key, the key German word, of course, that enters the vocabulary of um, literary criticism is Bildung, right, which is obviously not the same, is, is allied to Entwicklung and um, other words, um, uh, uh, me- meaning formation, a, a term that uh, gets taken over into the German life sciences from pietistic discourse in the 18th century. Um, and then it's quite early clamped on to, to Goethe's great novel, um, Wilhelm Meister, um, a Bildungsroman, I think it's 1819 that Karl Morgenstern gives a lecture um, where he applies that title to Goethe's novel. And it's, it's stuck, it's become one of those sort of categories that criticism tries to work with. Uh, and it's not always a useful category. Uh, there's a huge debate about whether Goethe's novel actually is a Bildungsroman, whether that there is even such a thing. It's one of those terms, uh, the Bildungsroman is everywhere and nowhere in the 19th century. But that debate, so I think, it conscious, Is it a conscious movement to construct Bildungsroman, or is, or is this just what we see in, in, in hindsight as people doing this, but not as a concerted movement or reading each other and talking to each other? Yeah. Yeah, I think Goethe did not use that term about Wilhelm Meister and both the critical view of that particular novel and the way that it gets received and taken up by another, other novelists turn it into something quite different from the actual, the actual object. If you read Wilhelm Meister, it's uh, for the first time with an idea in mind of what it must be like. It's, it's, it's completely surprising. The novel is much more wondering, aleatory, unfinished there's no sort of teleological progress towards the, the heroes coming into his own and some great moment of realization some sort of epiphanic command of his faculties um nor a sense of arrival anywhere the novel just sort of breaks off um uh but goethe is clearly thinking about these these these, these developmental categories how they apply how they apply to an individual story of maturation and development um, the, the quest for a vocation or the drifting in and out of possible vocations um, and larger sort of narrative arcs. Um, uh, those larger narrative arcs are what tend to get then retrospectively imposed on Goethe's novel and then made programmatic in later novels. Um, Scott again I think is crucial here because he stabilizes or seeks to stabilize this story of individual personal development of Bildung with a national history um, you know, young Waverley's progress towards maturity, his shedding supposedly of his youthful illusions is um, uh, 
recapitulates or is synchronized with the uh, uh, the movement of Scotland into modernity, into being part of the uh, the British state. There's a kind of governmental process of modernization that is supposed to um, order, regulate, and settle the hero's progress. And Scott understood that national history as recapitulating a kind of larger species history as it had been codified uh, in uh, Scottish 18th century philosophical history. Uh, and we find later novelists, I think, taking up this plot. I mean, Eliot's the interesting one again, um, uh, because Eliot of all our novelists is the one who is most attuned to and most alert to scientific and philosophical, philosophical developments ac across the curriculum, as it were, in Europe. She's um, you know, intellectually hungry and on top of developments in all sorts of fields. So she begins to explicitly integrate these narratives with plots of organic, what we would now recognize of, of organic evolutionary or evolutionist development. Yeah. Um, your most interested, to me, the part of the book that, that I, you already seized on it, but just the concept of Lamarckian historical romance just I mean, it just smacked me. It was so, it was such a cool idea. And, and then you begin this by talking about Count Robert of, of Paris, um, as you point out, a very strange and, and end of life kind of um, novel for Scott. It, it, you know, we tend, to, we tend to forget that the orangutan was long known, but the chimp and the gorilla were not really discovered until the 19th right. century. Owen actually dissected them and described them uh, from zoo specimens in, you know, the mid 1800s, but they just weren't known. And, and by the time they were, Darwin was able to look at the orangutan and look at the African apes and say, oh, well, you know, the African apes are more similar to us. So humans probably evolved from Africa, but, but this kind of genitive thinking, uh, genealogical thinking really is not prevalent with, with the novelist and the naturalist. It, it seems to come in spurts and some people have some great insights about it, huh? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it, it wasn't even clear what an orangutan was. I mean, all, all great apes indiscriminately tended to get lumped under that name or, or Pongo is the other term of art um, referring more to the, the African anthropoid apes. Uh, again, I think that sort of categorical blurriness was generative for novelists, for fiction writers. It sort of gave them, gave them this space within which to uh, imaginatively roam. Um, and I, I sort of make a passing remark, but it's something perhaps I ought to lean on more heavily, which is that uh, Count Robert of Paris and the other contemporaneous novel that I look at alongside it, which is Victor Hugo's novel, uh, Notre Dame de Paris, both novels with of Paris in, in their titles, um, published almost simultaneously, uh, coming out around the, uh, the, set, the July Revolution in, in Paris, which I think is also relevant to these speculations. Um, uh, they're almost a kind of science fiction, right? A sort of anthropological science fiction and it, Scott particularly, I think, shows how sort of narrow the boundary is or how porous the boundary is between historical fiction and, and, and science fiction. Um, if we go back far enough in time, perhaps things begin to change more radically. Um, perhaps we start encountering um, uh, life forms that are drastically different from those that we're used to now, including our own life forms. And this is a, a speculation that ranges back into a more remote history in Scott, but it's, it's a speculation also that begins to get future oriented in, in Victorian writing. Um, uh, you, you get a, a, I don't, again, don't really talk about them in the book, but in, um, in the 18, from the 1860s onwards, really, some very anxious attempts by a, a series of writers to think about human perfectibility in the shadow of Darwin, um, uh, you know, does future history actually afford us the sense of a kind of, you know, mutant super race, human super race, uh, or not, or something more frightening? Um, we find George Eliot sort of playing with this idea in, in a mm. very strange late essay sketch that she writes, Shadows of the Coming Race. Uh, mm. But it's all over sort of mid to late Victorian thinking, and uh, some of its issue comes in 
works that we now recognize uh, as science fiction, you know, H.G. Wells and so on. But it's, it's a current thought, I think, that's, that's already at work in many of these novels. Um, even the ones that seem most programmatically realist, I mean, Middlemarch, right, where Eliot really stakes out provincial life as the domain of realist fiction. Human nature is kind of stable, knowable, and recognizable if it's within certain temporal and geographical bounds. But even in that novel, there's a kind of weird sense that if you go very much, very far out in Middle March, things begin to be very different. Um, uh, there's the wonderful character, um, uh, the sort of frog-faced interloper, who Joshua Rigg, who shows up at one point, and uh, uh, there are sort of mischievous hints in, in Eliot's account of this character that uh, that he may. Uh, he may not actually conform to what is recognizably human here in Middlemarch. And it's sort of a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a joke. You can ignore it if you want to read Middlemarch as a canonical realist novel. But it's something that Eliot takes up and runs with in, in Daniel Deronda, which is her last, uh, her last great last novel, which is full of startling and astonishing turns of thought, um, uh, precisely about the racial but also species constitution of its characters. Um, uh, again, I think the strangeness, the weirdness of Eliot is something that, again, the critical tradition has tended to kind of smooth over and normalize. And part of the project of this book was to kind of recover a sense of the, the experimental strangeness of uh, these speculations. I mean, this is coming back to a point you were making uh, earlier, Kevin, um, but also how that strangeness is active in, in these novels. They're a lot weirder, I think, than, than perhaps we often tend to... to to think they are they've been sort of calmed and rationalized through you know mm -hmm. teaching and curricular and syllabuses and critical essays yeah there's a lot that's so heterodox in that i mean i mean just heretical even the the despite how many crazy characters there are in these novels they almost fail to match the characters of the natural historians and philosophers who who you're, you're, you're drawing from, they're so varied. You mentioned Buffon, who of course ran the Natural History Museum in, in Paris, right. um, was actually named a count and the king had to create a place for him to be, because there wasn't any such place. So, because it wasn't hereditary in his family, of course. And, and Buffon just wrote like these amazing 36 volume treaties on natural history. And like Aristotle, he just brought everything that people had said sometimes without really uh, critically thinking about it. Um, but and you can find all kinds of ideas in there. He says explicitly that the bounds of species may not be fixed. Right. And he was okay with that. That was, yeah. that was really all right. Although, although you're right, he did retreat. And of course, everyone, you know, the question of humans is a third rail uh, constantly, isn't it? You have, then you have, um, you have Lamarck, who is a madman. I mean, right. and he was so influential, but if you think about his whole system, he was the last person, as Pietro Corsi said, to have a spirit of the grand system, which basically we would probably say today is a theory of everything that explains everything and nothing at the same time. And Lamarck's was fluids. And That's right. how, how, do you, how do you reconcile a guy like Lamarck with such influence over, over, the literary world in, in such strange ways. Yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, yeah, and I, I wish I had said more about Lamarck or done more with Lamarck. Yeah, it was, it was extraordinary. I mean, again, it's science fiction. I mean, that's how we tend to look at it now. It's, it's like, this is the biology of some fanciful imaginary other alternative universe. Um, but it's kind of wonderful. Um, there's, there's a, I think, a real intellectual excitement in recovering uh, you know, the, the, as it were, the extinct species, uh, uh, the extinct thinkers who have not um, flourished and uh, gone on and, and, and left uh, a kind of tangible legacy. Um, uh, but they have their own fascination. And it's very much, it, it is the fascination in part of reading works of fiction um, uh, that are not bound by a sort of teleological uh, history of winnowing out what's true or what's real, but, but they offer us um, imaginative space exactly because of that, um, the space uh, for uh, 
the sense of thought experiments in action. I, I think that's what not, uh, fiction gives us. And I think that's, again, it's precisely what we now see as the craziness of Lamarck um, or the, the contradictions, the, 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 the excess of Buffon, right? That, that are generative in a literary sense and were generative at the time in a literary sense. Um, uh, this, I mean, it, my book stops in the 1870s with, with Darwin and George Eliot, partly because I, I find the later later fictional engagements with Darwin sort of less interesting. They, they become more literal minded as um, certain scientific canons get fixed and established. Um, it's as if uh, these literary works lose their, their, their sort of playful muscle in, in pushing back against and playing with uh, these, these conceptions that, that remain alive in, in a sense uh, when they're indeterminate, when they're still in play. Um, so I think, yeah, the, uh, the, the, what we now see is the weirdness of Lamarck, and it is weird, yeah, this, this notion of kind of fluid dynamics as the, uh, the reality principle of, of, of all life forms, and indeed all physical nature, um, is sort of wonderfully generative in a, in a uh, again, what we would now think of as a sort of science fictional way. Yes, I think you've hit on a really important thing about this with Darwin, where, where you start getting, and Wallace, of course, where you start getting natural selection as a principle and a very important principle, what strikes me is this comes so overwhelmingly from Malthus, who, who everybody read in the 1800s. It was inescapable. And as you remember, in, in Darwin's second edition of The Origin, he had to include an historical sketch of the idea of natural selection because so many people had written him to say that they had already thought of it. Mm, yeah. And in fact, what they had thought of was just Malthus, but applied to timber or agriculture in the way that Darwin and Wallace extended it to the natural world. Lamarck, you're right, there's just, and you know why he fits this, the premise of your book so well, I think, is that when we say fluids, I mean, Lamarck was obsessed with fluids from the atmosphere and the oceans and the rivers and the rain down to the fluids of the body. In each case, these things kind of bring elements of growth and renewal. And Lamarck really thought that the blood would bring, would bring elements, these fluids that would make blacksmiths stronger and they would, in, they would pass down these stronger arms to their to their offspring. Um, of course, if the blacksmith, blacksmith's arm happened to be lopped off, he wouldn't pass that down to his offspring. But you know, there's a there's there's just this idea that 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 development can make you change, and that change is a permanent change that comes in. And this was more or less Lamarck's mechanism for evolution writ, writ large. And that lends itself really nicely to literary developments, doesn't it? Right, absolutely, yeah, and and to a kind of progressive politics. Uh, I mean, Lamarck was politically attractive um, to radical and liberal thinkers um, uh, for that very reason. Um, yeah, Malthus is you know the dismal science. Um, he, he gets associated with a rather grim uh, strain in, in political utilitarian political economy. Somewhat later, um, uh, yeah, tends to be invoked as as as, as the kind of the, the, you know apotropaically. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, the case that, that limits the horizons of possibility and possible thought. Yeah, but he's all about survival and adaptation, isn't he? Because, you know, it's the things that make you survive. The, the I mean, even, or even though it seems like he's railing against the, the, the poor, he's, he's really trying to get them not to reproduce so that they don't achieve more misery, at least in his view. But he also says that although he heaps scorn on the, the Irish, um, less so on the Scots, but he, you know, he he will say that even even trades, even the the lowly sort of poor tradesman, if he's adapted to a profession, he'll survive and grow, and he'll be able to sustain himself. So th these things, to me, work in in the kinds of novels you're talking about about ways of surviving and changing and adapting to what to what changing circumstances are. As you bring out this kind of historical aspect that wasn't there before. And, but we can think of so many, so many novels and plays in which people change and then they don't change. I mean, 
does in Pilgrim's Progress, does he change? Uh, um, in the Henry trilogies of Shakespeare, does he change? Do you have the same person? Or, you know, do these people learn anything? Uh, this is a this is a really interesting yeah. development yeah. when you bring it to these these uh, novels. And of course, well, anyway, but go ahead with those because that those were great examples. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the you know, Bunyan, its change is comes from, it, it's God's grace, right? And it's once and for all, rather than gradual and self-powered. Um, uh, and that would be the difference um, between not just Bunyan's allegory, but um, earlier narratives based on Puritan providential plots, uh, where the change tends to be from absolutely from one state to another. Um, yeah, Shakespeare, it's, it's, it's really different. Uh, there, there is a notion of education, the education of a prince, right, which is a, a genre, um, a, a Renaissance uh, genre. Um, uh, again, what's, what changes, I think, in the, from the mid-18th century onwards is, is the notion of that change as, as neither sort of supernaturally requiring supernatural intervention, um, nor just confined to the the, the human exception, the privileged individual, it, 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 it's, it's seen as um, uh, a spontaneous, organic, and indeed molecular principle, right? Not just uh, um, that organic life. I mean, people like Herder begin to break down the boundaries between the organic and the inorganic. Um, uh, uh, and that seems to be the crucial difference. And because it's spontaneous and self-generating, it becomes, uh, it begins to break free from teleological plots, um, these processes of development become ongoing, open-ended, emergent, um, and, yeah, and, yeah. and that seems to be the, 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 the crucial difference. So now I understand why, why you don't include Hardy in your study, because Hardy is so Darwinian. Right, yeah. Isn't he, in a way, I mean, he, he gets everything that Darwin is saying, but he's not in that pre-Darwinian world at all. That, that's a, it's a very good, good um, contrast. Yes, and Hardy's been written about so well by yourself uh, and you have Gillian Beer in, in her great book, Darwin's Plots, which uh, really kind of inaugurated the, the movement of, of thinking about Victorian natural history and Darwin in particular in relation to uh, literary works and particularly the novel. And uh, yeah, Beer's, by making Darwin her sort of central figure, Beer is thinking about George Eliot and, and Hardy as her uh, as her main case studies, figures, as you say, who are much more thoroughly immersed in, certainly by the time Hardy is writing, um, uh, Darwinian principles have become uh, more or less canonical, though still contested. And he's able to take on board the full force of Darwin's theory, yeah. because it takes Eliot a while, I think, to, and, and as Beer comments, to really catch up with and process the full force of the principle of natural selection. When she first reads Darwin, The Origin of Species with, with George Henry Lewis, 1959, she assimilates him to the broader development hypothesis, which is still in some senses Lamarckian and uh, yeah. grounded in the sociological progressive models of people like Comte. Um, it's progressive, it's implicitly perfectionist, it's this constant, constant advance from simple to more advanced and complex organic states, it's still susceptible to um, progressive narratives of, um, uh, of rising or ascent from the simple to the complex. Yeah, this, yes, yes. What, 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 what do you, you devote a, a good part of your book to Dickens. Yeah. Of course, it was such a, a favorite among, among Victorian writers. Though Dickens, of course, was greatly influenced by Malthus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, um, um, the workhouses, of course, uh, and it was great social, um, uh, social crusader. Um, but the interesting thing is, I don't think he was known to Darwin, but he was friends with Richard Owen, who was Darwin's right. great nemesis. Right, right, absolutely. And I can't imagine two more different people than than Dickens and Owen. But can, can you tell us a bit about yeah. about how Dickens figures into all this? Absolutely. Um, yeah, Dickens, we know, read um, Robert Chambers's Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, which 
was the work that really popularized, popularized pre-Darwinian thinking. Uh, it's a, the book is a rather incoherent, uh, synthesis is probably too kind a word, it's a bricolage of various transformist ideas and speculations circulating in Europe from the Laplace Kant nebula hypothesis to um, the, the work of people like Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire and there's uh, Lamarck's in there even though um, Chambers feels that he has to re refute Lamarck. Um, uh, so it's, it's a rather incoherent uh, attempt to tell the history of the cosmos according to an evolutionist argument in which indeed humans arise from prior life forms. Uh, it was, uh, as uh, James Secord has shown in, in, a, in a very influential book that came out about 15, 20 years ago, um, it was massively popular. It, it sold in numbers to rival Dickens's novels. And Dickens himself read it and refers to it, um, praises it for popularizing scientific ideas in a um, a review that he wrote. Um, so uh, we know that Dickens knew that work. Um, uh, Chambers was part of the scientific establishment that poured, uh, sorry, Owen was part of that scientific establishment that poured scorn on Chambers, um, that, that these speculations were ungrounded, they were a kind of science fiction, not, not science. Uh, but it's interesting to find Owen himself adopting Chambers' hypothesis of species change in his famous Edinburgh Review of the Origin of Species in 1860, he, Owen admits that uh, transmutation, right, or, or transformism, but says that natural selection is not the, the mechanism. And he says it's something like um, the hypothesis that, that Geoffroy and Isidore Saint-Hilaire proposed, which is that it, uh, it's through um, the mutation, uh, uh, the deformation of embryonic development Yes, it's and, like it's like the ter the teratology. It's teratology, exactly. That you that you point out that the right. original meaning that it's it's a it's a it's a warped development, isn't it? Right, right. They're all all species originally monsters, monstrous deformations of of um, uh, embryonic development according to influences of heat, atmosphere, etc. Uh, Owen interestingly proposes that, quoting Chambers, um, in his review of um, uh, the origin. Um, uh, and my reading of Dickens in Bleak House is the novel I look at, but one could look elsewhere, is that this was a model that Dickens took really seriously. And it, I think it, it provides a natural historical and scientific framework for the very famous uh, effects of the Dickens character system. Dickens' novels, people have always complained since they were first published. They're not, uh, they don't give us a natural or real world. They give us an unnatural world full of monstrosities and grotesques. Uh, Bleak House is so striking, I think, because you can see all these little in-jokes where Dickens is playing with early evolutionist theory, recapitulation theories um, uh, at various points in the narrative. Uh, so Dickens is, a, is an evolutionist, but not a Darwinian one. He really, the, the novels don't work according to um, uh, the Darwinian notion of a, of a very, very gradual incremental development winnowed out by natural selection. Uh, instead, we have these um, a saltationist model, right, of sudden changes, so that within a Dickensian family, you, you seem to have these completely different creatures, uh, these different life forms that really challenge the basis of uh, of what we understand by the human or by human nature. Yeah, and events come out of the blue to change your life completely. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Coincidences and tragedies and, you know, catastrophes. Right, the great spontaneous combustion in the, in the center of Bleak House, yeah. And this is, you know, Owen, who, of course, almost no one knows, he was, he died in 1892. And by that time, I mean, he had been, everything that he knew had been eclipsed for decades. I mean, Darwin pretty much destroyed Owen's world very, very quickly, as well as 150 years of, of morphology thinking about form and function, dialectics. I mean, Darwin said it's all it's all variation and selection right, it's right, not right, built on an yeah, ancestral yeah. plant. Exactly. And right. I mean, one paragraph at the end of chapter six of the origin, which has nothing to do with the rest of the chapter. He just, he just annihilates this, this whole thing. And for Owen, who was such a strong morphologist, anatomist, um, and transcendental thinker in a very funny way, wasn't he yeah. for him, his, his views, he wrote so, Vaguely, no one could make out what he said. I mean, Huxley just 
mocked him incessantly and like ordained becoming of beings and you know this he 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 believed as you're pointing out that that as as earlier people as Lamarck had thought that there is de developmental variation that in an ecological setting can be um, acted upon, uh, realized, but even now, you know, we're using completely anachronistic words to describe what they thought. You just can't even get there. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, th I think it's a, uh, uh, we, we've, you mentioned Pietro Corsi's work who, who writes yes. about Lamarck and he's been probably the major figure in recovering Lamarck is an interesting complex figure and what he calls Lamarckism. He points out that there's all this other early transformist thinking across the European continent, which gets lumped together under the sign of Lamarck, but is often independent, quite different. Um, and I think we need more of that. And, and Owen would be a, a prime case for just recovering this body of thought and connect, reconnecting imaginatively, to, imaginatively with it. Um, I mean, Darwin's prestige as such of the what used to be the great triad of, of 19th century scientific authorities looming over the following century, Freud, Marx, and Darwin. He's the one who's sort of scientific authority within the scientific fields to which he spoke seem, seems to kind of remain um, uh, unchallenged or, or if challenged, chipped, chipped away at the sides. Um, yeah, he's, but kind that just the, meant... he's kind of the Anthony Fauci of, <laughs> right. you know, 19th century science. Right, yeah, when to ask who the other that other figure may correspond with. But yeah, it's meant these other figures have been completely eclipsed, right? Um, uh, got, gone extinct in intellectual history. And, and I think it's really um, a fascinating, actually necessary project to kind of recover those thought worlds and, and re-immerse ourselves in them, um, uh, partly because of their difference, because they do not conform. Uh, they get us away from a sort of presentist narrative of history in which everything tends inevitably towards where, where we are and what we think. And I think we need that more than ever, that, that openness to alternative ways of seeing the world, even, even when they may not be scientifically valid or even precisely articulated as, as you're saying of Owen. Yeah, so before we get to any questions, um, what do you still want to do with Darwin? Um, I want to write about Darwin sort of in, in his own terms, but but reading him as a as a complex literary figure, so it's not it, the, the the book which would be a short book. And there's an article coming out actually. I'll make a plug for it in the in representations this this coming summer. It's oh, on on aesthetics Darwin, and this has actually attracted a lot of attention recently. There's a there's a wonderful huge book um, uh, on on sexual selection on the genesis of by Evelyn Richards on the sort of genesis of Darwin's sexual selection theory which has rather been in the shadow of natural selection uh, and there are a number of other works paying attention to this but uh, and understanding the central place of the aesthetic sense in Darwin's account of human evolution so I'm interested in that I'm interested in 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 the ways that for Darwin himself scientific knowledge scientific observation and knowledge are continuous with um, what we think of as aesthetic modes of apprehending the world, of, of, of apprehending form in the natural world and discriminating among the interplay of forms within a system. And um, that's a quintessentially aesthetic praxis. We, we see it at work in earlier thinkers um, and indeed acknowledged as such, for example, in the work of Adam Smith, who just comes to mind because I was teaching him in a course this semester, it talks about the, the love of system, the beauty of system as actually the motive power for projects of political and economic improvement at one point uh, in the wealth of nations. So I'm interested in connecting Darwin with a kind of larger intellectual and philosophical history, which isn't just one confined to the natural sciences, but also, uh, reading the works uh, and the ways in which he's engaging all sorts of genres and discourses. I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in the early, the, uh, the early writings that come together in the so-called Voyage of the Beagle, uh, where Darwin is trying on the styles of the 18th century travel writer. Um, uh, and uh, so that, uh, it's all still a bit hazy, bits of it are becoming clear, but that's where I would like to go with that. Well, I can, I can, I hope we'll have 
a chance for a lot more conversation on this. And Absolutely. You write the travel, they all loved Humboldt, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, didn't Humboldt's uh, massively get enough of interesting. Yeah. Well, we've, we've had nearly 90 participants. They're all still here pretty much, but we have only one question so far, and it comes from Tim Hampton. And he writes, Ian, after listening to you two, I can't wait to run and read strange writers like Buffon and Lamarck. He doesn't realize how strange they are. <laughs> You make them seem interesting. Are there novelists or novels that we might not normally read, yeah. but that we can now take more seriously after your work? Can we rethink the novelistic canon? Yeah, I, I would hope so. I mean, the, the book looks at really kind of major canonical works. And that was part of my intention was to make the case that this way of uh, reading the history of the novel can be articulated around some of the very famous sort of landmark works in, in, in the critical history from Wilhelm Meister, through Scott to Dickens and George Eliot. I mean, I would say, I mean, the, the, the case I would want to make for figures like Dickens and, and Victor Hugo, who tend to be outliers in a sense that the history of the novel is dominated by the rise of realism. But, you know, F.R. Lewis' great tradition, it goes, uh, you know, from Jane Austen through George Eliot to Henry James. Uh, and James, of course, becomes the figure around whom modern, um, novel criticism constellates itself in James's work, partly because James is himself theorizing what he's doing in very powerful ways. And James was no lover of, of Dickens. He wrote these sort of famous acerbic reviews early in his career of, of Dickens's late novels. Um, so one thing I would want to do is make the case for why Dickens is actually as rigorous um, a novelist in the kinds of world building that he's doing as George Eliot is. And the same goes for Hugo, you know, again, much condescended to the sort of bombastic, flamboyant, outrageous Hugo, who isn't part of that line of the novel that goes from Balzac and Stendhal up to Flaubert. Um, though about a lot of Balzac is very Hugolian. Um, if I were to do the project again, it would be, uh, I would want Balzac front and center. He's, I think he's incredibly interesting figure in light of this, but he's, he's scarcely a neglected novelist. Um, the weird, uh, the one outlier among the case studies I talk about is that late Scott novel, which nobody reads or nobody has read until very recently, or if they read it, they throw up their hands in, in bafflement. Uh, and I think it makes, reading that novel makes Scott a much more complicated and interesting figure than people tend to take him. So that's not a very satisfactory answer. Um, uh, and I would have to think a bit more about, yeah, outliers, um, outliers who might suddenly begin to glow with all sorts of unaccustomed light if we were to turn. Yeah, I, you're, you're, you're certainly asking us to read what we've often already read in a different way, which is you know, probably the best service that can be done. How many, how many, you know, gems hiding under a bushel like Count Robert can you find, but this is good. Right. I think maybe Colleen might have wanted to answer this question. Colleen, did you want to unmute and go ahead? Did I get that wrong? Okay, well, maybe not. Go ahead. There she is. There she is. You can go ahead, Kevin. Thank you. You sure? Okay. Oh, fine. I'll get to the other questions then. Um, uh, Lucy Jacobs writes in, hi Lucy, and says, in what way would new insights from other forms of transmission of traits like epigenetic gene culture coevolution mm. might be related to the ideas of Lamarck and Owen. And she asks, is there a 20th or 21st century equivalent of a scientific canon shaping the novel? These are good questions. Yeah, that's a great question. You're, you're probably able to answer it better than I am. Yeah, I mean, some of the vulgar popular um, accounts of, of epigenetics which is not the same as epigenesis, right? This 18th century um, sort of evolutionist um, way of thinking about the life sciences have, uh, have seen it, you know, have, have invoked the shade of Lamarck, right? Um, uh, acquired characteristics, it seems, uh, what uh, the experience of an organism in its, in its, in its lifetime can um, affect uh, uh, its, its biochemistry in ways that are then heritable. Um, that's that's taking such a broad view or broad account of what Lamarck or Lamarckism is that I, I'm not sure that it really connects with Lamarck's thought. Um, yeah, I think we, we are seeing a lot of uh, contemporary fiction that's responding to current scientific ideas, um, some of it in, in science fiction proper. Um, or dystopian. 
Right, right, or dystopian, or the, uh, I mean, the current movements around notions of the post-human and, and, and the Anthropocene and, and ways to, uh, fiction again is trying to think our way out of that in ways that aren't always convincing. I mean, novels remain artifacts produced by human beings. Um, I mean, I'm reading right now with very mixed feelings, Richard Powers' novel, The Overstory, which is an immense long thing that I'm about halfway through. And I, I kind of wish, you know, it's about trees. And part of its remit is that trees are these, they're the original Eden, Edenic beings before the fall, right? Um, uh, uh, operating, in, in, you know, in slow time, but able to communicate and think in ways that are largely inaccessible to humans until very lately. And I kind of wish that Powers had just gone ahead and written a popular book on current tree science. That's actually more interesting than the novel, which gets bogged down in these rather um, uninspired, at least I'm finding them so far, sort of human plots. Yeah, I think probably Jurassic Park fits our, right. our zeitgeist a little better than, than that. Right. Um, thank you, Lucy, for these questions. Uh, um, Nicholas Matthew writes, apart from his work on natural history, Buffon is probably most famous for his essay on style. Yeah. I suppose the style concept has always been balanced between nature and culture, human and non-human, body and tool, and so on. I wonder what the relations might be between literary style and contemporary natural history. Wow. Wow, that's, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, and, and Buffon at the time was criticized for his stylistics, right? That he was importing so-called literary styles and modes of, of analogical reasoning and so forth and conjecture into his natural history. So yeah, he writes his essay on style partly as a defense. Um, yeah, that, that's such a great question. I'm not sure I can answer it. And, and of course, it goes along with the notion of style as somehow an, as something personal, like an emanation of the, uh, an expressive emanation of a particular author, uh, as well as that which is supremely kind of crafted and the, um, the effect of culture and convention. Um, yeah, in scientific writing now, again, you, you could probably answer this better than I. And if we were to move out of the the thriving realms of popular scientific writing, in which, of course, I'm, again, this is something I've been thinking about recently in relation to thinking about Darwin, the way that this genre, the natural history of man, that sort of gets invented in the late 18th century, um, where the protocols of natural history are addressed to telling a story of the human species as, as a subject, that's uh, that's still going strong. It's ragingly popular. I mean, you know, Yuval Harari's book, Sapiens, is being touted by The Guardian as one of the hundred best books of the 21st century. Uh, there's another book in that genre just been published called Humankind by, I think, by a Dutch author. I forget the name. I just saw a review of it yesterday. Um, but these are really works of popular popularization rather than of scientific inquiry per se. The relation between those I think is really interesting. It was a much softer border or the relation between those was much less clear in the 19th century. I mean Darwin writes the on the origin of species and the descent of man for a general Victorian reading public. It's not like his essays on barnacles or coral reefs or orchids that are, that are more. Yeah but I think, I think you make a really great point that that when when some scientists or quasi-scientists are writing and interpreting science for the public. It really is a, a quite a, a borderline with the science fiction like Jurassic Park or Contagion or the kinds of things that, um, that really are what good science fiction is, just a slice away from what we know or can grasp at the moment. So this is a great question. Um, Padma Rangaran, sorry, Padma Rangarajan writes, Ian, may I ask a perverse question about the role of poetry and a uh -huh. shifting role vis-a-vis -vis the novel. Are there ways yeah. in which these questions about evolution and natural history become present in the evolution of poetry over the course of the century? Now, of course, we have to start with Darwin's grandfather. Right, uh, yeah. The, yeah. Loves, the, the loves of the plants, yeah. uh, which was seen as very salacious at the time. And, and to go full circle from opening our opening today, Darwin's grandfather was um, very much, he was very Lamarckian and very much a part of that Scottish, um, English Renaissance. Right, the Lunar Man, right. Yes, the Lunar Man. Bir Birmingham Enlightenment, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and perverse questions are great. And actually, that's, that's, that's not a perverse question at all. Um, actually, the, poet, the relationship of poetry to this has actually been m much better studied. Um, there's, there's a lot of great work being done on, on 
Erasmus Darwin and by my colleagues here at Berkeley, by Amanda Goldstein and Kevis Goodman. Um, and yeah, Devin Griffiths' recent wonderful book, um, uh, The Age of Analogy, opens with Erasmus and closes with Charles and has really interesting things to say um, about them. And, and the, the other point of reference here that's been very well known uh, is, is, of course, Tennyson and the, the so-called evolution stanzas of In Memoriam, which again are based on Tennyson's reading of Chambers. It's the work is, is pre-Darwinian. Um, so yeah, I, th I think quite a lot of attention has been paid to poetry and, and the other critical work I would cite here is Maureen McLean's wonderful book, Romanticism and the Human Sciences, um, which is mainly about Wordsworth, Coleridge and Percy Shelley, but has a fantastic discussion of Frankenstein in relation to Malthus and Buffon and um, emerging um, biological conceptions of, of natural history. Uh, in terms, I, I, this is of course a period in which the novel begins to incorporate and respond to poetry, especially lyric, right, as one of the ways formally and modally in which it's reorganizing itself around the turn of the century. And, and the key figures here, I think, would be Goethe and Scott, um, who interpolate lyrics into Wilhelm Meister, into Waverley, uh, in ways I think that are making a really interesting claim on lyric poetry by the novel, in ways in uh, Scott is historicizing it in really interesting, complicated ways. Goethe is doing something quite different. Um, yeah, I, I, I have not thought about how the, I, I think Padma's quest, Padma, your question is really about how the history, you know, the, the poetry as a as sort of developmental narrative itself might be inflected by this. And frankly, that's not something I've thought about. Um, uh, it would be a great, question to pursue. Maclean's thesis, which is a powerful one, is that um, through Wordsworth and Coleridge and their contemporaries, poetry, particularly what M.H. Abrams called the greater romantic lyric, becomes the genre that reclaims human language and the human faculties for the human in a, in a kind of era uh, where that the category of the human is felt to be existentially under threat. But we're having so much fun. There is one more question, if if we can be in, indulged, from Penny Fielding. Your book ends with the intriguing idea of Eliot as a science fiction novelist in the decade before science fiction emerges as a novel form. So after this apparent bifurcation in genres in the 1880s, what later realist novels would benefit from being read as science fiction? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it may be harder to answer because uh, the 1880s, of course, is the, you have education acts and therefore a proliferation of, uh, of, of what we now recognize as the genres of popular fiction. They really consolidate uh, from the 1880s onwards, uh, which means that the, the realist novel or the literary novel itself tends to get cordoned off from these popular genres and, uh, and the, the kind of quarantine borders get harder and harder. Um, it would be interesting to think of some of the experiments of high modernism in relation to this, right? Um, I mean, someone like Wyndham Lewis uh, actively does um, his weird and, and all but unreadable experimental novel, The Childermass, which is a sort of weird modernist satirical dystopian redoing of Dante's Divine Comedy, um, which he writes 1920s or 30s, and then picks up again in the 50s as a, in, as a science fiction novel in the, the the, the last two volumes of the human age, um, are much more recognizably the, the sort of Dante-esque afterlife is a sort of science, nightmare science fiction landscape. Um, and certainly there are novelists who've moved between the genres. Doris Lessing would be famous and, and of course, uh, would be a primary example and her Canopus on Argos series, a science fiction series rather, I think that her critics did not know what to make of this or thought of this as perhaps a rather regrettable move away from her strengths, even though this was a move that Lessing herself uh, took very seriously. Uh, and I think a lot of recent fiction has, I mean, Pynchon, Thomas Pynchon, another great example, right, that the boundaries between so-called um, uh, mainstream fiction, science fiction become very porous. Um, the way that um, a pulp writer like Philip K. Dick has been mainstreamed in literary theory and criticism by people like Frederick Jameson, Slavoj Žižek, and in turn, um, I mean, Pynchon owes, owes a huge amount to, to Dick and other pulp writers. Um, 
So I'd say it's easy to do now. Um, it's perhaps more of a problem from, say, the generation of Henry James uh, on to the 1940s. Um, yeah, another great, actually, uh, recent masterpiece, hybrid masterpiece of Alistair Gray's novel, Lanark, a uh, great experimental Scottish novel of the early 1980s that um, shifts between a sort of more or less realist Bildungsroman, or Kunstler Roman, and this, um, again, sort of science fiction afterlife imagination, imagination of a kind of alternative Glasgow uh, through which the characters pursue their, their unhappy pilgrimages. Well, this has been amazing. I've, I've just enjoyed this so much and, um, and just your, your scholarship's incredible and just all the things you explore in this book and in our, in our talk today are, are, are wonderful. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be able to talk with you about this and also to um, um, Tim and Colleen, the people from the Eric and the people from the Townsend Center. And of course, everyone who tuned in um, and has stayed so long um, uh, clearly enjoying things, uh, which, which which I never expected it would actually go this long. Um, but there we are. And um, thanks to everyone for participating. Now, I've forgotten how we're going to close out. Colleen and Eric, uh, anything more to say? Or do we just end the meeting? We're just going to end. Thank you both so okay. much. Okay. I would like to just reiterate my thanks to everybody, and especially to you, Kevin. Thanks. That was, that was, a, was a wonderfully generous and generative uh, interlocutor you've been. It's a huge pleasure. I'll never, I, I'm not making any threat to Terry Gross, but you know, we have a good time. We have a good time. That's what matters. Okay. Absolutely. Thanks to everyone.